All right, so this is from the Saladin book. I don't know what's in the OpenStax book as far as a visual is concerned, but this is from the Saladin book. This thing keeps getting shorter. It's getting broken. Um, so now the, the story actually starts with cholesterol, right? So cholesterol is converted by enzymes in the small intestine to a slightly different chemical form called 7-dehydrocholesterol. And that is released back into the circulating blood. As the 7-dehydrocholesterol is passing through the skin, the melanocytes of the epidermis under the influence of ultraviolet light will convert the 7-dehydrocholesterol into cholecalciferol. Now that is what we typically refer to as vitamin D, all right? So if you take vitamin supplements, what you're gonna see on the label of the vitamin supplements is cholecalciferol. So this is what we would consider to be vitamin D. Whether you're getting it through your food, whether you're getting it through a vitamin supplement, whether you're making it for yourself and with your skin, this is what we call vitamin D. Now vitamin D will leave the skin. A lot of this gets stored in the liver. However, the liver will also convert some of this cholecalciferol to a different chemical form that is called 25-hydroxyvitamin D or hydroxycholecalciferol or as it says in this book, calcidiol. Now none of these have any physiological activity. None of these are the active form yet, right? So the liver will release the calcidiol, 25-hydroxyvitamin D, 25-hydroxycholecalciferol, back out into the blood. It circulates around with the blood, and as the blood is passing through the kidneys, if parathyroid hormone levels are low, which is to say that your serum calcium is normal or maybe even a little high, but your serum calcium levels are not low. If parathyroid hormone levels are low, the kidneys will simply allow the calcidiol to go out with the urine. You'll excrete the inactive form. On the other hand, if parathyroid hormone levels are high, an indication that calcium levels are low then the kidney will convert the calcidiol into calcitriol, which is also called 125-dihydroxyvitamin D or dihydroxycholecalciferol. This is the active form. This is the one that's, this is the molecule that's actually going to have physiological activity. Leave the watch alone. Thank you. All right, so this is then going to be returned back into the circulating blood. This is going to have an active physiological activity. This is the hormonal form. And as it circulates with the blood, it is like parathyroid hormone, going to increase osteoclast activity. So we're going to get an increased breakdown of bone matrix, releasing calcium to the blood. Like parathyroid hormone, this is going to inhibit the kidney from excreting calcium. The kidney will reabsorb more calcium, taking it out of the urine, putting it back into the blood. These are things that parathyroid hormone can do. The main event when it comes to dihydroxycholecalciferol, 125-dihydroxyvitamin D calcitriol, 
is that under the influence of that molecule, the small intestine can absorb and will absorb calcium from your diet. Without this, your small intestine is pretty much incapable of absorbing calcium out of your food. You can be eating ground up oyster shells, taking bottles of antacids, drinking gallons of milk, and without this material, you're not gonna absorb any of the calcium, or very, 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 very little. So the calcitriol, 125-dihydroxyvitamin D, dihydroxychylocalciferol is absolutely essential for the absorption of calcium from your diet. Okay, did you get it all this time? I think so. Okay. All right, does anybody else have any questions or anything they want to go back over? All right, well that, that gives us a nice lead in because the next thing I wanted to talk to you guys about is really, for me, one of the more interesting aspects of any sort of discussion on vitamins and nutrition. The way they teach nutrition today is so different from the way I was taught when I was in school. Uh, back then, this of course is during the dark ages, you understand, but, but back then the emphasis was on what happens if you don't get enough of a vitamin. The emphasis was on vitamin deficiency. And they don't really seem to emphasize that very much anymore, but there are some really cool diseases out there that get, get started if you don't have enough of this or you don't get enough of that. I guess when we were kids, they were trying to encourage us to take our vitamins. Because I, I'm so old that Flintstones vitamins came along after I was already an adult. When I was a kid, vitamins were in liquid form and they tasted kind of nasty. So yeah, like you get this big old tablespoon being shoved at you, eat this, and you're like, oh yeah. All right, so pleasant tasting or easy, uh, easily eaten or chewed vitamins came along a lot after I was too late to enjoy them. All right, so I want to share with you guys a little bit of information about vitamin D deficiency. Because this does affect the skeleton. This is something that has immediate effects on the skeleton. There's actually two forms of vitamin D deficiency depending on when in your life this occurs. In childhood, vitamin D deficiency causes a condition called rickets. Now, without vitamin D, without the active form of vitamin D, it is almost impossible for your small intestine to absorb calcium from your diet. So even if there's plenty of calcium in the diet, you're not getting any benefit from it. In children whose skeleton, whose bones are actively growing, this can be a very serious problem. The osteoblasts will go ahead and lay down the matrix. So the cartilage will grow and the osteoblast will lay down the osteoid with the collagen fibers and the hyaluronic acid and all that kind of stuff. And then it's time for the osteocytes to pull calcium out of the blood and put it into that matrix to firm up the, the matrix and make it hard and <coughs> bony and they can't do it because there isn't enough calcium in the blood because you're not getting enough vitamin D. So in children, the bones become very soft or they remain fairly soft, easily bent. Uh, let's see, I had something else I wanted to say about that.
soft. I said that. Flexible. That was the word I was looking for. Now, with babies, with infants, the, the effect of this may not be immediately seen because infants spend a lot of their time lying down, all right? Or they're being carried. But when you're talking about toddlers, when you're talking about children who are starting to get old enough to stand up and walk, now the whole weight of the child is being pressed down on bones that aren't hard enough to support their weight. And so what you see is bowing of the legs, <clears throat> deformities of the pelvis, get scoliosis from that? Oh yeah. I had, I had something about the, um, okay there it is. <coughs> Deformities of the pelvis, rib cage, skull. There might be abnormally long arms and legs. The epiphyseal plates are still going. The cartilage is still adding on but it doesn't get mineralized. There, there's So the growth becomes abnormally long in the arms and legs. Without sufficient calcium, the nervous system is also gonna be disrupted. So these children tend to be lethargic And they're also going to show flaccid and weak muscles. Because muscle activity also depends on calcium. So let me get, show you a couple of pictures. Uh, this first one is of a fairly young child, but it's a little hard to see the full effects because the kids uh, covered pretty much from their pelvis on up. But you can definitely see the effect on the legs here. All right, Th this child is maybe, I don't know, five, seven years old. And, and look, at, look at the spread of their pelvis and how those legs have bowed out just from trying to support the weight of the child. Here's an, here's an older, child probably getting into close to the teen years again you see the bowing of the legs but look how long these legs are look how long these arms are uh, the the rib cage tends to be what's called pigeon chested which is to say it kind of gets pulled out uh, so that it, the, the chest may look abnormally rounded like the breast on a pigeon or a chicken turkey We don't see much of rickets here in the United States anymore, but it used to be a fairly common condition, especially at the beginning of the 20th century in urban areas. Um, these days, I think almost everybody gets most of their vitamin D through vitamin supplements, right? But back then, before those were common, the best way to get vitamin D through your food was to eat foods that are naturally high in vitamin D. Now, I know a few of you have had nutrition or are taking nutrition. Does anybody want to know which foods are naturally high in vitamin D? Don't even want to guess. Was it, was it milk? What now, milk is now high in vitamin D, but it isn't naturally high in vitamin D. Milk is naturally high in calcium, but they put the vitamin D in. It's what's called an enriched food. So by itself, just right out of the cow or the goat, 
milk doesn't have all that much vitamin D. Yeah. Yeah, you know, usually people go right to the green leafy vegetables. How many times have you been told you need to eat more green leafy vegetables because they're good for you, they're high in vitamins? It's vitamin yeah, but it's that's not vitamin D. Did you have a, did you want to make a guess? I saw your hand kind of you know, Actually, none of the fruits or vegetables are going to do any good in this area. The foods that are naturally high in vitamin D are things like oily fish, salmon, mackerel, anchovies. Yeah, hang on, canned tuna. Apparently not fresh tuna, but canned tuna, canned sardines, <coughs> whatever those little fish are when they're still alive apparently, it's fresh fish, they're not going to do you a whole lot of good, but canned, uh, they're very high in vitamin D. Um, those are saturated. Like, they like, literally sit in the mirror and get it. Yeah. In yeah, they do. And, um, that seems to have something to do with the fact that the fish somehow either gets its vitamin D or it preserves the vitamin D. But yeah, the, the source I was looking at said, no, it had to be canned tuna and sardines. The, the fresh ones won't do you as, good, as much good. Um, cod liver oil. Now, most of the white fish um, like cod or grouper or so on, the, the flesh of the fish, the fish part, isn't particularly high in vitamin D, but liver stores vitamin D. So if you take their livers and you smush it all up and extract the oil, then you're going to get a fair amount of vitamin D out of that cod liver oil. Some types of mushrooms as long as they're grown under UV light. Which is kind of tricky because most mushrooms are grown in the dark. Um, did you guys know they do a lot of mushroom farming around here? Yes. Yeah, I, I was surprised. I, actually, I shouldn't have been surprised. The, the typical growth material for mushrooms is in fact horse manure. And with all the horse farms around here, what they do is they go out and they collect up the, the, the bedding that's been soiled. So they take the, this kind of mixture of hay and, and animal waste and they kind of compost it down a little bit and then they take it into the mushroom barns and they spread it out on these racks and then they put the little mushroom spores on it and it grows mushrooms, but it's usually done in the dark. So only the mushrooms that are grown under UV light have a fair amount of vitamin D in them. Speaking of liver, B for calf's liver. Chicken livers would probably do you. I was trying to, re I don't think that hog liver Pork liver is really much used in this country. I, I can't think of anybody who goes, oh, yummy, let's have a nice big slab of, of pig liver. Uh, but it would also probably be a fair source of vitamin D. It's just not used much as a food around here. And egg yolks. <coughs> so some mushrooms beef or calves liver, egg yolks. These are, these are the foods that you would need to be consuming on a fairly regular basis if you wanted to have a natural source of vitamin D in your diet. Well, I was telling you that back at the beginning of the 20th century, and I'm not that old, I wasn't really there at the time, I've read about it, uh, what you had was a period of time in which a lot of people were leaving the farms, leaving the country, 
and moving into the city where they could get jobs in factories or textile mills or they're taking jobs in mines, coal mines, metal mines, that sort of thing. So what you have at the beginning of the 20th century are a lot of people who are spending almost all of their time indoors. The work day back then was 12 hours. You got to work before the sun came up and you left work after the sun had gone down. And that was five and a half days a week. Most people worked five full days, 12 hours a day, and then they'd work half a day on Saturday, and you got Sunday off so you could go to church. And then it was back to work on Monday morning. So people, children, children worked too, by the way. There was no law against it. Children as young as five would have jobs in the factory or in the mill or down in the mine because the family needed the money. Wages were incredibly low back then. And so if the, if the whole family was going to have a roof over their head and the whole family was going to have something to eat, the whole family has to go to work. So these foods are expensive. They're hard to get. Uh, working class families, working class children were generally eating bread and potatoes and maybe boiled cabbage throw a few onions in there, meat once in a while, eggs hardly ever. It's a very low vitamin D diet. And the result was that rickets became nearly epidemic in this country. Uh, according to some of the sources I was reading, in some of the larger cities, among working class families and middle class families, almost 80% of the children, 80% of the children were showing some form of rickets. And these deformities are permanent. This, this you don't get fixed. So as these children are getting older and their bones are becoming more deformed and their skeleton and their muscles are becoming less uh, properly aligned, what you're going to have is permanent disability and these children as adults are going to have a really hard time working at the kind of physical labor that working class people did back then and still do. So they're going to have a hard time getting a job, they're going to have a hard time keeping a job, they're not really going to get much ahead in life and the whole cycle of poverty and disease and disability starts all over again. 80% of the kids, that's a very high percentage. But we hardly ever see it anymore. <coughs> Several things have made the difference. Why don't we see rickets today? Go ahead. Oh, I thought you were just going to Oh, I guess one would be the enriched milk. That you yes. One of, one of the things that is different now <laughs> is, in fact, enriched foods. By law, any milk or milk product sold in the United States must have vitamin D added to it at the dairy. Whole milk, 2%, skim milk, fat-free cottage cheese, yogurt, you name it, it's got vitamin D in it. Why milk? Well, you would think so, but that's not really why. Why milk? Because little kids like cereal? Because little kids are going to drink milk. That's right. If you want to prevent rickets, you got to put it in foods kids will eat. And Children are given milk. They are told to drink their milk. They are given ice cream and they are uh, given cheese and you know, you gotta drink your glass of milk before you can leave the table and all that kind of nonsense. It's good for you. Yes, the calcium is a benefit, but it's really because children will, will be given milk. Children will drink milk. 
All right, what else have we got going on here? What else has changed since 1900? The hours of work. Let's go back to this medicine. I'm not Somebody. sure I understand. Vaccination. Well, but that has nothing to do with rickets. Okay, well, yeah, I mean, no, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you get measles or not. It's it's all about rickets. Now, hang on, I'll get back to you. You said something. The work hours have changed. Work hours have changed. Like for who? For everybody. Children. Well, for children too. For children, children can't work. Children can't work. <laughs> children can't work. That's right. So one of the things that's changed is the fact that we have child labor laws that prevent young children from spending all of their time in factories and coal mines. Yes, ma'am, in the back. Well, I was, what you were saying about the the more kids not Yes, it is, it is true that, that vitamin supplements are actually much easier now than they were. I mean, cod liver oil. Oh, eh. But he was saying vaccinations, and I'm like, oh. Mm. Yeah, I was looking for something more specific. So yeah, I think we can definitely say we have better supplements. Oh, by the way, if your children are not at the factory earning their 10 cents an hour, where are they? Outside, in the sun. Really? Hopefully. School, thank you. <laughs> All right. So another social reform that led to the great reduction in the incidence of this disease is universal free public education. Your kids go to school whether you can pay for it or not. Right? You, don't, you, can be, you can be three years behind on your taxes and your kids still get to go to school. Now, the quality of public education has become more of an issue, but your kids are gonna go to school. They're gonna learn to read, they're gonna learn to write, they're gonna learn to do arithmetic. Uh, and if they're in school rather than in the factory, aren't they still indoors all day? Well, they have recess. And That's right, they have recess. Any smart teacher is going to let them outside for a little while every day to let them run around in the sunshine, fresh air, burn off some of that energy, and get some ultraviolet light. All right. So yes, that's going to, of course, include recess. Get them outdoors. Get them. Get them into the healthy, fresh air. Get them out into the sunshine. Okay. Now, if the kids aren't at work. They're going to school. That means that their wages are not coming home, right? So if the whole family has been depending on everybody in the family having a job and bringing home money, and now half the family isn't, are we just going to let all those, all those other people starve to death or get thrown out into the streets? What do we need to do to compensate for the lack of the child's wages. Raise the wages. For the adults, right. right? So another thing that happened about this time was the very first of the, what are called living wage <coughs> laws. But we would now call minimum wage laws because you can't actually live on them. I was, I was intrigued, I was reading something, I don't know if it was in a newspaper or a magazine or something, but apparently this phrase of living wage is starting to make a comeback. People who have been struggling to make ends meet on minimum wages have given up the idea of simply calling it minimum wage. They're now like, no, we need, we need to make enough money that we can pay the rent and the utilities and put food on the table and put shoes on our kids' feet. And that's a living wage, that is not a minimum wage. So the phrase is making a comeback, I think. All right, so what we have is a whole lot of changes in the way people live, changes in the what people eat, 
changes in where people are spending their time, and the result is that rickets in the United States and other developed countries has virtually disappeared. Uh, in other parts of the world where foods that are high in vitamin D are not available, vitamin supplements are just priced out of a, pers a working person's ability to buy them. Medical care is pretty minimal, and there are no laws protecting children from work. We still see a fair amount of rickets. All right. Now, in adults, vitamin D deficiency is a little bit different. The condition is called osteomalacia. which in Latin means bad bones, <laughs> all right? Um, this is seen primarily in women. And the, this again is a disease of poverty who are experiencing, how did I phrase this? Repeated and closely spaced pregnancies. Beep. While living on a diet that is primarily grain. When, when they talk about cereal and nutritional aspects. They don't mean like Cocoa Puffs. They, they mean rice, wheat, barley, corn. And there are still large parts of the world where people, especially the, the working class people, the poorer people, live on rice or potatoes or porridges made out of wheat and barley. They get very little in the way of fruits and vegetables. They get virtually no animal protein in their diet. No meat, no fish, no eggs. It's too expensive. It costs too much. The primary symptom of osteomalacia is pain when pressure is applied to the bone. such as when standing or walking. The bones become, during the pregnancy, what's gonna happen is that the woman's bones are going to lose calcium in order to supply calcium for the growing bones of the fetus. So as the fetus is developing, she's losing <coughs> calcium while the fetus is acquiring calcium. Pregnancy, 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 one right after another, there isn't enough time between for her to reacquire the calcium and remineralize her bones. So the bones are becoming leached of their calcium They become soft, flexible, and easily broken. This is when they tend to lose their teeth a lot as well? Oh yeah. Well. Yeah, there's probably also vitamin C deficiency. Uh, tooth lo losing your teeth or hair is usually associated with scurvy. See, I told you I knew about this. Yeah. So scurvy, which is a lack of vitamin C, is tooth loss, but it probably is this as well, because the, the jaw bones are gonna start becoming soft and, um, yeah, could be this too, or a combination of the two. Let's face it, someone who's living on rice is not getting a whole lot of vitamins in any condition. All right. 
this is a real problem. Um, one, of, one of the things that makes addressing this an issue are cultural norms, right? When I say women, I'm kind of exaggerating the definition here. In many parts of the world, especially in parts of India and in Asia, the way that the society is put together is boys inherit all of the property of the family. Your sons are going to inherit the farm or the mill or the factory or the ranch or whatever the family's business is that is providing it with money, the boys are going to get that. Girls don't inherit property. Girls are not even expected to own property. So when the family has girl children, they're kind of seen as useless. They're not going to be able to bring in money. They're not going to be able to support the family. They're not going to be able to take care of the parents and the grandparents when they're old. All these girls are is eating and asking for clothing and sucking up the family's resources. They are a financial burden on the family. So in many places in the world, girls are married at extremely young ages, 11, 12, 13 years old. The family, cover your mouth when you yawn, please. The family will essentially sell this child to some other family to get rid of her so they don't have to feed her anymore. She is now somebody's child bride. And her job as a married person is to produce children for that family, for her husband's family, preferably sons. So she will have a baby a year until her body just wears out and she can't, she can't support a pregnancy anymore, at which point the family may you know, they may let her stay around to help raise her, her children, or they may just get rid of her and get a new bride for the, for the, for the boy, for the son. Yeah. How do they get rid of her? They murder her. Some parts of India, the preferred method is to throw oil on her and set her on fire. Oh, what a horrible kitchen accident that was. Yep. So... We've got uh, this whole cultural situation behind this disease. These people are poor, they are ignorant, uneducated, I should say uneducated people. They're doing the best they can, but what are we going to do? We can't, we can't advocate birth control. They can't afford it. And they don't understand it when you, when you try. Vitamin supplements, nutritional situations, again, it's outside their ability to buy the kind of foods that they really need. And if they could buy these foods, they're going to feed them to the boys, not to the girls. Yeah, this one's tricky, but... You're going to be surprised. And as soon as I say it, you're going to be like, yeah. How do we fix this? Education for girls. The reason why girls are getting pushed into early marriage is because the family sees them as having no financial value. But if a girl can read, if she can write, if she can do simple arithmetic, she can get a job. She can work and she can bring in at least enough money to support her part of the family. She can pay her own way, maybe even make a little bit more. And now she is financially valuable to the family. A girl with education is going to be a lot more valuable than an illiterate 
girl who, who can't do anything other than have babies. When girls get an education, even if they're from the poorer classes, their families will wait to find her a husband. They will delay her marriage. She'll be 18, 19, 20, 22 years old instead of 12. And they'll be able to marry her into a higher status family. She'll get a better husband with a family that's a lot less likely to set her on fire when they're tired of her. So schools that will accept girls, schools for girls, education for girls, is seen as the best way of breaking this cycle of poverty and disease. It's controversial. There are plenty of places in the world where they still think that school is wasted on girls. But we are starting to see some progress here and osteomalacia is also slowly disappearing from these parts of the world. We're still eating rice but if they can make a little bit more money, they'll throw in some fish. Did you? Three, they're already on their third pregnancy. Yeah, it, it's heartbreaking. Yeah, and, and when you try to explain to them how to control, how to, how to prevent that kind of pregnancy, they, have, they don't know what you're talking right. about. They really don't. You're right about the pain. That was one of the biggest complaints from most of the females was pain. Yeah. Like yeah. Uh, did anybody watch The Handmaid's Tale? Yeah? Anybody? A few people say yes. Most people say no. Uh, I don't know. What, I don't get HBO, so I don't know if how good that show is, although everybody said it was really good. I read the book. And I'm old. Right? I read the book. And there's a line in the book about how the breeders don't need their feet. If your whole job in life is to have babies, you don't need feet. And one of the punishments for rebelling against the society was to have your feet bones broken. They just take a big mallet and mash your feet so you couldn't walk. Now you can't get away. Kind of gruesome. All right. All right, so education for girls seems to be the best thing to do if we want to break up osteomalacia, if we want to do something about that. All right.